Alright YouTubers, how you doing all on this Friday evening? This is the Club of the Man 1993 and we are here hopefully for two pre-recorded reviews tonight. Hopefully I won't get sleepy or anything like that during this review because I just finished watching Smackdown. So my plan is try and record both of these tonight. If I'm still waking up after that, I will record another part of the Let's Play I'm working on for Roller Coaster Tycoon. Maybe we'll see if I'm too tired or not. Because after these two live, not live, these two reviews, this AW review I'm doing right now, and the SmackDown review I'll hopefully do after this, will be my last two reviews until the premiere of my brand new intro. I'm still very excited about that and looking forward again to starting my Instagram page that I hope to, you know, skyrocket and get off to a really, really good start um, with the um, with, with that page after um, Chamber on Saturday. So um, we'll roll into that, of course, later on in the time. It's now time to talk about this past week's episode of AEW Dynamite. The February 15th, 2023 edition took place in Laredo, uh, Texas. Um, this show was okay. I'll say it was solid as a courtesy. I didn't hate it. There were some, some cracks I felt in some of the storytelling. And some weird decisions they made on this episode of Dynamite. That kind of let me head scratch it like, okay, why are they doing it this way? Like, why are we overproducing it with a fatal four way instead of just a two on two tag match? Or when are we going to kind of like get a little more of the ball rolling and explain more of this Soraya and Tony Storm heel turn? Also, who the heck is, why is Preston Vance, who I knew, I know had recently turned heel, but I feel like he's mostly been featured on like Dark and Rampage. For those who don't watch all that shows, why is he with Roosh? So, and of course the fact that what are they going to do in the meantime with the build for MJF and Brian Danielson's Iron Man match at Revolution. Because now that, you know, Brian's jumped through all the hoops, it kind of feels like... We'll get to it in a second. Uh, about how I feel like that this is kind of like going to coast until we get to Revolution. But it wasn't a bad show. But, you know, other than a few things that I really like, like, the Wardlow promo was good. Adam Cole was on the show again, which was interesting. Uh, Christian Cage returned um, from his injury as well. Was like, We're setting up a match for there. So there was some good stuff. The rest of it was just, it was just okay. Just okay. So... We're gonna roll through and talk about it. Like I said, some cracks I felt, like some weaknesses, got exposed in this episode of Dynamite. It definitely was probably again, it wasn't a horrible episode as you can say, but it was one of the weaker episodes of Dynamite they've done in recent memory. Because they were starting to get back on their mojo. This one was kind of like like a breather, maybe, or something. I don't know. Let's talk about it. The show opened up with a match with... It's an eight-man tag match with Billy Gunn, Orange Cassidy, and The Acclaimed taking on Jay Lethal, Jeff Jarrett, which, by the way, rest in peace to Jerry Jarrett, father of Jeff Jarrett, who uh, just passed away a couple days ago. I think right before this as well. So credit to Jeff Jarrett for still being able to go to work, but I'm pretty sure it's a tough time. Sorry. A tough time for his family right now. Uh, Jay Lethal, Jeff Jarrett, Satin Singh, and um, Sonjay Dutt. This match, you know, was fine. 
was what it was. The baby faces win, have like a big, you know, big group scissor happen afterwards. But later in the show, because during the match, um, the guns, Colton and um, an Austin gun, showed up on the stage holding the tag titles. And of course, they clearly made their attentions and wanted the tag titles back. But for some strange reason, they're going to have a fatal four-way at Revolution. Why a fatal four-way? Is it because they're going to bring back FTR and they don't want to make that third team very obvious so they're going to have a four team to kind of like trick us or something? Like, it, it doesn't... It doesn't quite make sense. I mean, yes, the gun. I mean, the only reason I say FTR is because the guns, of course, do have a history with FTR. They were the ones that kind of wrote them off the show for now, so they could come back trying to get their revenge on the guns of just like um, the acclaim they're trying to as well. But it's just like, why make this a thing? I mean, again, I kind of see why not, but it's like, if like, why couldn't they, of course, just make it just the guns versus the acclaim? Why does it have to be a ball type man match? I feel like also what's hurt it is the fact in the past year or so, most of the um, the tag title, the, well the not the trios, uh, the um, the tag title regular tag title matches have been like triple threats or fatal four ways. And I feel like that's also why I kind of like went like uh, towards this is because once again they've been doing this how many times for the past year. And also, again, storyline-wise, wouldn't it make more sense just to have the, oops, sorry, the Acclaim go after the titles? I mean, if if you're doing this because you want to, you know, um, throw us off about FTR, you could just advertise as just, you know, the Acclaim versus the Guns, then have FTR to show up within the next week or so, since Revolution is almost here, didn't realize that. But, um, but, um, they could have had, had, like, FTR of a surprise return and do get thrown into that match, but don't advertise that it's going to be, like, a triple threat or a fatal four-way. So, that was a little strange, I thought, with that happening. Uh, Brian Danielson cut a promo about how MJF can't last an hour the way he can and were informed that the champion is uh, contractually obligated to appear on the show tonight. So he appeared later in the show. Get that in a second. Um, we also, we did have this tornado tag match. It's between uh, Blackpool Combat Club's Claudio Castagnoli, who's the Ring of Honor, excuse me, world champion, and John Moxley versus a team of Roosh... And Preston Vance. Again, now I haven't really talked about him, but Preston Vance, of course, formerly was number 10's Dark Order, had turned, I mean, it was all on Rampage, had turned heel and unmasked. Instead of having his name spelled P R E S um, T 1 0, press 10, press 10 Vance, he is now just Preston Vance, or his nickname is. Preston Pero Pelgroso Vance, which I don't know much that means. But they have this random tornado tag match with the Blackpool Combat Club. Also, is it just me? Or, of course, since Regal left, has the duo of the Blackpool Combat Club, not duo, the, the, the group called Blackpool Combat Club, feel like it's a little... A little bit unnecessary and like a little directionless because you're seeing Claudio and Moxley have matches. Although Mox is in the you know in the midst of a feud with Hangman Adam Page, Wheeler shows up sometimes, but it seems ever since Regal walked out the door in that segment where um, uh, I think either I think it was when MJF did attack Regal from behind. The allegiance of Brian Danielson to the Blackpool Combat Club has been strange. Like, is he still part of it? Or did they quietly just scale him back from it? You know? So, I don't know what that's, that's confusing. And, of course, also, 
There's Roosh and Preston Vance teaming up. Why? Again, I don't know. Like I said, it's kind of my fault. Also, I don't watch, you know, Rampage or um, Dark. But, you know, do I really have the time to? So, not 100% my fault, but it, it kind of, you kind of just wish it would give a little bit of an explanation uh, for those who do not watch um, those additional, you know, one-hour special shows or whatever they have. So, I definitely wasn't quite into this. I mean, yes, you know, it was a typical, you know, tornado tag match with John Moxley with, you know, somebody getting busted open. Um, Blackpool Combat Club do get the victory, but again, I just like, I don't, I don't know why Preston Vance and Roosh are a team. Uh, backstage, we have The Butcher, The Blade, and Kip Sabian attack Hangman Adam Page uh, until the Dark Order comes in and makes a save set up for um, his match later on tonight. Well, Hangman took on Sabian later on tonight. Uh, one of the best parts of the show is definitely this interview with Wardlow. A simple storytelling moment that allows you to, you know, get invested, get the sympathy on the baby face, and a good way to hype up for a TNT title match that's taking place at uh, Revolution with Samoa Joe and Wardlow. But, um... Uh, he's basically asked what's next. And Warlow says how he and Samoa Joe have lots of stories. But he wants to talk about his father. The way as a small child he built a strong relationship with him. But his dad left and then came back. But as he came back into his life, he had stage 4 cancer. And the next time they met was when he was in hospice. Which is very sad to hear. Uh, and Warlow was just starting to wrestle and his dad was able to make it to his first show and the only thing he could tell him to to give him any peace was that he'd be a better man and he'd do right and the next morning he got the call saying his father had passed. Which is very sad of course to hear how that all just happened. You know, you know not having a relationship with your father for much of your life then you finally do but then it's right when he comes back to your life he's gone. And um, there's some message he left for, of course, as well, right before he passed. But anyways, so, um, what was I at here? Uh, he then grew his hair. Um, and, or his, his, and his beard, he had grown both of them out. Because it was, it was basically like, you know, a similarity to his father. So when Joe recently cut Wardlow's hair, it basically kind of like broke that one thing that makes him think of his father, which is going to make Wardlow going to come, come even more dangerously after Samoa Joe because he's never going to be the same man again and he will not survive. But that was a good, you know, simple promo to get sympathy behind a babyface. Now we know that there was a bigger deal behind Samoa Joe cutting Warlow's hair. And for what it sounds like, it sounds like in the storyline, Joe knew about that. So if he did, oh, best to know that Warlow's going to come after him even more dangerous at Revolution when we had the TNT title match. Uh, Mark Briscoe defeated Josh Woods, and it's later than announced that Mark Briscoe has signed a contract with AEW. He's still carrying the Ring of Honor tag titles, even though, again, his brother has sadly passed away. So I wonder what they're going to do with those for sure. And I'm also, I'm also hearing rumors that Ring of Honor is getting a weekly show, I, I think, on some autolite streaming site or something like that, which, if that is the case, good for them. I'm sorry, I am yawning like crazy. But, um, then we have Renee Paquette interviewing Adam Cole. Cole says he feels great and he loves being back on the road with AEW. And part of him is discouraged that he's so close to the ring, but not quite ready. And he's learned to celebrate the small victories. Like the way he can look to the right without his right eye twitching. Basically implying again that he had... A very, very bad concussion when he was out. There's a lot of concerns, of course, for sure. Uh, he said he feels there's a lot of chapters to his story. He hasn't been able to explore yet, and he thinks the roster top to bottom has never been better, and he knows when he does come back, uh, he has to be prepared as possible. He won't name names, 
But it's going to be good for AEW and good for Adam Cole when he comes back. So we're going to see who he will fight with first. Or edit, maybe he'll make it for maybe Revolution. Good, you never know. Or they may start setting some up at Revolution, maybe. We'll see. Um, then we have MJF coming out to the ring. Which also, I'm still wondering too, if they're trying to make Adam Cole be the one. When he's ready. To eventually be the one to dethrone MJF. I mean, MJF and Adam Cole, woo, that'd be a great match. Um, but MJF comes out and says how Brian Danielson has no clue how much these fans love him, and it pisses him off. Not too long ago, these schmucks used to be devil worshippers, but he knows these people are disgusting, fickle little monsters. Probably taking a shot when Brian was chanting fickle when he was a heel a couple years ago. Uh, so he turned his back on them before they turn on him. But let's be honest. Uh, he's honest about who he is. The devil. But these people don't love Danielson. They love who he is when he walks through the aisle. He's a worthless sack of trash who's been given everything he has. But that's not all of why he hates Brian. He hates Brian because he has three people convinced that he's better than MJF. And we probably think Brian's the best in the world too, right? Of course, that's the first of several times MJF said best in the world. People wonder that's a reference to CM Punk coming back, which of course we will see. Um, is it because he entertains us the best or does the coolest maneuvers or um, holds? Um, um, is it because he put on five star uh, bangers? Who knows? Well, sorry, I got distracted for a second, but little secret though. It's not why you get into the business. You get into business for one reason only, to become world champion. Last he checked, he's the champ, and that's something that Brian Danielson has not been done yet in AEW, is won the AEW world title. He's not an idiot. At March 5th, Brian's going to give him everything he's got. But um, either way though, he will still be victorious. But you won't be able to take your word for it. You listen to a man that Brian looks to as a mentor, which is the fallen angel, Chris Christopher Daniels. So, hold on, let me just answer this one text really quick. Okay. Um, so Christopher Daniels comes out. And I guess apparently MJF had basically paid um, him... To diss on Brian Danielson on live television. Um, basically um, saying uh, Chris Daniels was like, I would be happy to take the money and bury Danielson for hours, but that's not the man he is today. And the truth is, Brian Danielson is said to knock on MJF's dick in the dirt. What's up with the, people, with the AEW having lines of like dick in the dirt and everything? It's very strange. But he remembers the first time he was in the ring with Danielson. He was when he was twenty when Danielson was twenty years old and he got hit so hard he thought he was gonna die and that's when he knew Brian was gonna be great. He watched Brian win King of the Indies in APW two thousand one, which directly inspired the creation of Ring of Honor. And our Ring of Honor brought real pro wrestling that was starved of at that time. The same kind of fans who were ecstatic when AEW opened just a mere four years ago. So if there wasn't a Ring of Honor, there may not be an AEW. And if there wasn't an AEW, there would be no MJF. So Brian always tries to learn a new thing every match. And Chris Daniels has watched him grow into a consummate world champion. And he's confident that Brian will win the AEW world title. Because uh, Brian's exactly what MJF wishes he could be. The best in the world. And MJF, though, is just a fraud. But of course, MJ gets all pissed off, swats the mic out of the hand, and starts screaming that he is the best in the world several times, which again is at a tease. Daniels discreet tries to leave, but then MJF pulls him in and slaps him. Then Daniels tells him not to ever disrespect him again, but MJF's like, screw you, and he puts him into the salt of the earth. Brian comes out, and then MJF just runs off. So, like I said earlier, 
This MJF and Brian Danielson feud. Little bit of repetition still. With, you know, MJF having these stipulations, these hoops that Brian has to come to jump through. But now, is it is it going to be like they just coast until the match, though? Because I thought the whole idea of the story was that MJF is doing whatever he can to stop Brian Danielson from having the match. And tonight it was more so like, well, okay... He tried to get to Brian mentally, so maybe he did try, but instead Christopher Daniels did not, you know, fall for it. So maybe they were trying to go for that, it just didn't come across to them at that, that first. But like I said, it may be a little strange trying to, you know, get the booking to where to the match, but the match is gonna be great. It's just I just wonder how the promos are gonna be the rest of the way, you know? But um uh, Jungle Boy had a solid match with Brian Cage. Jungle Boy did win with a folding press. But afterwards, though, Christian Cage comes out with his arm in a sling. But then um, Jungle Boy, who's, who's had a history with Christian Cage, um, rushes to him. But then Christian sprays him down with mace. And he then takes off the sling that shows that he is good to go. And he chokes Perry out on stage before hitting the kill switch. Are we going to get that? Big bluff match between them at um at Revolution. Because Jungle Boy and Luchasaurus had a hell of a steel cage match at full gear. But I'm hoping we get done because I cannot wait to course to see that match. Christian Cage and um Jungle Boy, that's gonna be pretty good, I would say. Um Renee Paquette is back to interviewing the gun club, and again, this is basically when we're told about the um the Fatal 4-Way, so it's going to be them, um, the Acclaimed, and then, of course, two other teams. And one of those teams will be crowned... Um, I'm sorry, the two... And the, the, both of the challenging teams will be crowned in the battle in the Casino Battle Royale next week. Oh, oh sorry. Next week uh, will be a battle, a, a battle royale, and the Casino Battle Royale will take place at some point further down the line before the pay-per-view. To determine the final four teams. So probably FTR will return in the Casino Battle Royale. Before they set up that um, uh, Fatal 4-Way match at um, Revolution. I don't know if I'm going to make it for SmackDown's review tonight, guys. Because I'm, I'm just already like losing my focus and the energy. But anyways, sorry about that. Um... A.R. Fox and Top Flight have a backstage interview with, uh, well, they, they confront the Elite, basically asking for another match on Rampage, and they give it to them. Um, Hangman Adam Page beat Kip Sabian. Do you even care about Kip Sabian? Because I don't. Yes, he has improved, but I just don't give a single crap about Kip Sabian. Um, afterwards, though, Blackpool Combat Club minus Brian Danielson comes out. And then John Moxley comes in and he goes, "He, I know you think we have unfinished business, but to me, we're done. You got your ass pinned last time. I have a little respect for Hangman, but not fear. And he's got his numbers, and there's no chance he will ever, ever beat Moxley again. So this is done. But Hangman's like, nope, not happy with their last match. And the result doesn't make... Th- he doesn't think Moxie does either. So Box had hoped he'd have some friends to talk into a smaller decision. Which of course leads to the Dark Order coming out. And it's been a while since we've seen Hangman hang with the Dark Order. So I'm not quite sure again what their bond is there. But basically Evil Uno tries to talk um, smack on John Moxley. Which leads Evil Uno the pie face Mox. And then... Finally, Moxley agrees to have one more match with Hangman and Page, a uh, Texas death match at Revolution. We'll see how it goes. Even though again, all these uh, street fights and death matches are basically the same thing, just different names and whatnot. Um, the JAS um, basically say how Chris Jericho is not giving Ricky Starks another match against him, but Daniel Garcia will take on him on Rampage this Friday. Um... Oh yeah, we also have this segment where apparently, kayfabe wise, Hook has been suspended 
And banned from coming from shows kayfabe-wise because he put Stokely Hathaway in a little bit of pain last night. Or last week. Why? I mean, yes, he did, but we've seen how many other superstars put their hands on officials like that. Why all of a sudden is, is it a problem here? I don't know. And then the main event was Britt Baker, Ruby Soho, and Tony Storm. So, the gist of this match is basically Britt Baker and Soraya fighting over um, whose side is Tony Storm really on. Is it with um, Soraya and Tony Storm? Or is it with uh, Britt Baker and Jamie Hayter? I also think that they kind of need to speed up the pace a little bit with this. Because right now, it just seems like Soraya just randomly turned heel. No rhyme or reason as to why. So, I, I mean, yes, like what I'm predicting could be happening. It just feels like it's just taking just a bit too long to get to the point. Because if I had it my way, I would still be cheering Soraya over Britt Baker. Britt is just much better as a heel Yes, Soraya would be a good heel. Again, what I'm saying thinking into is that they got to come out and kind of like explain this whole agenda further for Soraya. I still think they need to do this thing where, um, um, crap, I 100% lost my train of thought. Oh, I'm right now. Basically, treat like what they were going to do with Paige and Absolution before she had to retire in 2018. That's what I think that they should try to do. I mean, because again, they're having this weird thing. They haven't quite explained, you know, why they did what they did. All they're doing is just spraying L's on everybody's chests. And then they're attacking Britt Baker and Jamie Hayter. You know, they just had some personal business going one-on-one -on -one against each other at full gear. So why all of a sudden are they trying to make themselves as the good guys instead of, you know, all that villains and what and what and what and whatnot and whatnot. I don't know. It's just weird that they're taking you know probably the hottest you know heels. Well, even though Jamie Hader is teasing babyface momentum, but um, I don't know. It's just it's just it's just odd. And again, the whole point of them you know spray painting the L's. Not too sure why. Like I said, I feel like that this storyline's got to like pick up the pace just like a tad before it starts like getting a little repetitive. You know, but but that's dynamite. I'm tired, guys. I'm gonna skip doing SmackDown. I and wait till tomorrow at some point. But I'll give dynamite a B minus. Again, nothing was horrible. Everything was just solid to okay. But yeah, this will be the last dynamite review I do um, without my new intro. So again, that will be debuting after my Elimination Chamber pay per view review. Uh, again, I want the review SmackDown though at some point tomorrow. Again, I'm just I'm getting too tired now, so I'll have to wait till then. But um, but yeah, uh, B minus for Dynamite this week. What grade would you give Dynamite this week? You can change your thoughts down in the comment section below. And be sure as always to slap a like on the video and subscribe more content on my channel. Follow me on Twitter at the Club of the Man ninety three. And be sure as always to shout for me while sub at the Club of the Man ninety three on TikTok. And guys, again, I'm checking out. I'm tired. I'm going to go to bed now. I'll catch you guys all later. Have a great, great rest of your evening. Peace out, buddy. Yeah, no, I will